And I'd just like to start by acknowledging that the land on which um, I am uh, presenting to you today is the land of the Ghana people. Uh, and we very much repay our respects to their elders past and present and for any Indigenous people joining us today. So we're here this morning to discuss the growing issue around deep, deep fakes and AI-generated images and video uh, and how this is impacting the quality of information that is being received by the public. Um, now, of course, this issue is not new. It's been around for a long time. But the pace of development is just incredible. I'm sure everyone um, would agree with me that it seems like just about every month there's some new piece of technology that just mind, it blows your mind and you think, well, you know, wow, what next? Um, so today we're going to talk about that new technology, the trends, um, and some of the issues that come with those, both po positive and negative. Um, so today we're joined by four speakers. We have Will Berryman, who is the Director of the Royal Institution of Australia. Then we will hear from Professor Simon Lucy, who is Director of the Australian Institute for Machine Learning at the University of Adelaide. Um, following Simon, we will hear from Professor Monica Attard, and Monica is the Co-Director of the Centre for Media Transition at the University of Technology, Sydney. And then finally, we'll hear from Rebecca Johnson, who is an expert and researcher in AI and ethics, and she is at the University of Sydney. So we shall start with Will Berryman. Over to you, Will. Thank you, Susanna. Look, just to reinforce the point that you made, um, the pace of development, I think, in this technology is something that as somebody observing and commentating on technology for 30 years has never seen. Um, I remember the first piece of video I saw streamed on the internet was a postage stamp sized uh, picture, uh, weirdly, that came out of a room in Paddington in Sydney. You could barely make out that it was somebody waving at a camera. That was in the early 1990s. And if you think about it, it took you know, the best part of a, a decade and a half before we had the viable types of video that we could watch in our homes that we were used to in the television. I think with generative AI um, and and all of the associated tools around it, it's breathtaking. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a bit about open AI, I saw it before. Um, I think the challenges that it presents to the communications environment are profound um, and, and really important that as a nation that we start to grasp what they are. Um, it's getting to the point uh, where it's very difficult, particularly in still uh, pictures uh, on a first reading for a viewer to be able to tell the difference between something that a machine has generated uh, and not. Um, and I think we get, it's kind of breathtaking when we look and consider the kind of amazing pictures and now video at its whole Um that generative AI could produce. But what concerns me is the tiny changes, the tiny modifications of reality um, that can change a story, that can change context. You know, there are examples of having of the press, you know, having done this in the past in a disreputable way, changing the facial expression of someone they want to make look more demonic or, you know, the cropping of a picture in a certain way. Um, and that's when the press is doing it. I think, you know, uh, from a public point of view, that really strikes at the heart of trust when it can be done uh, maliciously, uh, when it can be done at scale. Um, I, th I think that that is very, very troubling uh, for, for law enforcement. It's very troubling for the way that ordinary people form their opinions uh, and act. You know, it's another, it could be another supercharged avenue of misinformation that overwhelms us. You know, we live in a, a plague of misinformation. It's a scourge. Uh, it strikes at the heart of community trust. And, uh, you know, a generative AI you know, has the potential to be another uh, instrument um, that, 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 that can supercharge uh, this wave of, uh, of difficulty we have. I think the natural reaction of legislation is to try and push back or try and ban, try and prohibit or try and fine. I think in this case that the, the technology is so powerful, um, so readily available. There's such a community 
you know, that's able to draw upon the developments of others, that, you know, that's quite a narrow view. There actually are enormous benefits uh, in generative AI to the communications environment, whether they be ordinary people or, you know, practitioners of curated media like like ourselves, like a publisher, such as the, the Royal Institution. There are some wonderful things that, that we can have. So the natural reject to ban or, or punish, you know, there's an element of, of that in there. Well, but I think that it's very important now that as a nation that we start to have a nationally led dialogue uh, about how these technologies are ushered into and accepted by the community. And I think that it's important for organisations to start around their information that they publish to create a kind of blanket of trust around things. It's very important that images that that um that that that, that are taken, uh, you know, have both quality curation stamps, have technical stamps, so that provenance of information um, can be checked. You know, that people can check to see whether something's been modified. People can check the source of a piece of information and look at the chain of how you know that information got to them to be able to determine themselves whether something's trusted or not. And I think that that's going to have to require a partnership between different types of organisations. You know, organisations such as Simon at the cutting edge of the development of of vision-based AI tools and and their verifications. Organisations such as ours, uh, a publisher of scientific factual information. You know, we have a partnership with Simon to start thinking of how we build these sort of trusted things. I think in this case, journalism becomes really important again, not as a purveyor of opinions, but as a purveyor of verified facts of checking. You know, I think that's a, a really important part of the blanket of trust. Over 30 years, curated media has fallen away. Uh, in place of information everywhere and information at our fingertips. And I think we we threw curation away too quickly as a societally important thing. And I think, you know, in looking at how to usher in, you know, generative AI, particularly in, in images and video, that curators that are trusted, that are verified, that have some form of stamp of approval in what they do are really important to come together um, to be able to give the public an ability to trust what they see because the technology is so great. And I think the last point is, as a nation, in terms of communication environment, we've tended over the past 30 years to surrender to global media sources. The amount of curation that happens in Australia is smaller than it's ever been. The amount of technology in communication and information that we develop ourselves is smaller than what it's ever been. Um, you know, we are dominated by uh, global technology. We're dominated by global information sources in the country. And this is an important thing that we need to understand. Um, you know, in AI-based generative tools are only as good as the information that we put in them. They're only as good as what we feed I think the public need to understand is that they don't think for themselves. They're not like a painter or an artist or a creator. They create to a degree, but they create based on the inputs that are put in place. If those inputs are coming from global disreputable sources by which we don't have any source of verification, they are going to end up in our communications environment. And part of this blanket of trust means that Australia needs to start to think about the sovereign authoritative information that it puts into generative AI for the purposes of its community. You know, we can't rely on the values, principles and information, you know, and the ability how that information is verified and, and, and published around the world with our own information sources. You know, we're starting to see that commercially sources of verification are turning the tap off. They're not letting tools, you know, use their information to train the New York, New York Times turning off. In Australia, a lot of our media outlets with trusted information turning off. AI globally is being exposed 
to information that we wouldn't trust, we wouldn't accept. So I think it's very important that Australia starts to think as part of this blanket of trust and verification that it wraps around its information. What does sovereign trust look like? What does sovereign information look like in order to feed these tools? Very important, Australia has sovereign generative AI capacity here, that we are starting to build technologies that are mirrors and reflections of the trusted values that we as a country want in information. I think that's an important dialogue that the nation can't afford to have next year. It's something that it needs to have now because these technologies, you know, are gall- galloping on at an enormous pace. Terrific. Great. Thank you very much, Will, for the scene setter. That's terrific. So over to you, Simon. Thank you very much. And Simon, please let us know when you'd like us to play the video. Sure. Um, thank you so much, Suzanne, and, and thank you so much um, for um, yeah, the invitation to come along here. Uh, so I think Will set the scene really, really well there. Um, it is sort of this, I think, um, in many ways, it's a, a scary time and an exciting time, right? I think a, a lot of sort of tech pundits like myself were were sort of sitting back in awe watching so these amazing videos come off um, OpenAI and Sora, and we're, we're going to show some videos of that in, in a couple of minutes. But um, also just sort of the sheer uh, magnitude of what's happening at the moment. And I think we'll set the scene really, really nicely. Um, I might quickly just talk about myself quickly in the context that I can kind of bring to the conversation. Um, I'm currently the director of the Australian Institute for Machine Learning. Uh, Many people in Australia probably haven't heard of it. Um, We are the leading institute in the country for machine learning research. And we're actually globally ranked in an area of AI called computer vision which is the technology or the area of AI that is really to do with sort of um, understanding images, but also now more and more generating images. And so we oftentimes, um, the Institute's got around about 200 people in it, and we've been set up since about 2018. So we're relatively new, but we've been growing really, really quickly. Um, And one thing I think that we've been growing on the back on is sort of this explosion in what AI can do with images. And and in many ways, it's good just to have a little bit of a, a think about the history of what's been going on. The idea of sort of people using technology to manipulate images and videos has been around for a long, long time. I mean, that's sort of like even post-World War II, things of images of dictators and other people being manipulated, that's been around for a while. But um, the ease and the magnitude of the technology in terms of being able to manipulate things has just exploded. And so a lot of it can be traced back to the... um, um, this new discipline called deep learning, which is a part of AI. And when you hear the word deep fake, that's what it's giving you a nod to. It's not some sort of um, anything about sort of um, generating the images deep underwater or anything like that. It's um, it's a deep um, learning. And so it's a nod to that. And oftentimes AI in its early years was used to analyze images. So if you wanted to detect a face or detect a car. But around about 2014, a new generation of tools was um, created that could generate images. And it started off with a couple of techniques. Um, If you're a bit geeky like me, there's things like GANs or diffusion. Um, And what we've seen is this this massive, massive acceleration. And the other thing that's really helped too is is the explosion in not just imagery, but also text. So we also know ChatGPT, Um, we know the amazing things it can do. And what we're really seeing at the moment is the intersection of these two technologies coming together. So the ability to actually simply just write a couple of um, words and to be able to easily create images. And um, just as of um, last week, being able to kind of generate um, videos in a very, very easy fashion. And this might be a good point to actually bring up um, the um, video that we were um, referring to before. This is just a video while well, it's coming up of the OpenAI site, um, kind of, and this is coming from the new Sora system. And um, it, it, essentially, all it took was just a couple of um, sentences, just describing um, the scene, um, the person, and um, generating up like amazingly HD sort of um, content. Um, and it's something to behold. Like I sort of like when I first saw this and I've been working in this field for like 20 years or so, I was gobsmacked. It's amazing. But I would encourage um, those of you who've been checking it out, have a look at the videos. And it, it's a bit of a like a, a Where's Wally type thing. I um, mean, you can play these things back and you can actually see some of the mistakes in the videos, even now, even though they're amazing. Um, my daughter pointed this out to me. If you look at um, the lady in question here, looking at her legs, you can see that the legs are actually not walking always backwards and forwards. They sort of flip over. 
each other sometimes. And it's very, very subtle to see, but you can see these sort of telltale signs. Um, and so people have been trying to utilize these sort of telltale telltale signs to kind of flag if something's fake or not. And um, initially it was pretty easy, right? You could look at an image and someone's got six fingers or the eyes are not positioned in the right, uh, the right position, but it's getting really, really hard um, to actually detect these things, especially by the human eye and even using AI systems. Um, so as Will was sort of speaking to, there's a, a lot of things that are coming in place at the moment um, to kind of help with that. Um, there's things like digital water, watermarking um, and uh, digital watermarking is basically, it's kind of like watermarking currency, right? You're sort of trying to do something imperceptible to the image, but allows you to flag that something's been manipulated. And in sort of tandem with that, or a companion idea to that, and Will also spoke about this too, is this idea of secured provenance. So the idea that sort of like, say when I take an image, could I cryptographically embed where the image was taken and the device it was taken from, so that I could perhaps track the provenance information and perhaps work out whether, well, can I trust this image or not? Um, and there's a lot of excitement around this idea too. So a number of big companies and governments even um, have been sort of signed up to this. And so the, the most notable um, example of this is something called C2PA. Um, and this is a, a protocol that's been pushed, put forward by government and companies. Um, but the problem with this, right, is that it's, um, it's useful for the good actors, right? The people who want to be responsible. And so there's always going to be sort of this, um, unfortunately, fake content or deep fake content that seeps through. And so it's interesting to see what Australia is doing in this regard. And it really is sort of um, a wake up call in many ways to government and to media and to the innovation sector here in Australia about what to do. So I've been sort of pleased with some of the signaling that we've been seeing. Um, I've, I've seen that we've, we've already been, um, Australia is trying to kind of position itself as sort of um, um, a global player in this area of AI called responsible AI. And um, the government's also put together a new AI expert group um, to actually sort of advise the government over some of these ideas. I'm, I'm pleased to say that I'm a member of that AI, AI expert group that just um, met actually a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we're, we're going to have regular meetings and um, giving insights to the government over over that area. And But it really kind of speaks to the opportunity that Australia has in this regard. Um, I, I really think that we can't really compete directly with the big global superpowers in AI like China and the US, but there are certain sectors of AI that we are globally excellent in. Um, we are globally excellent in this area of computer vision. We have amazing capability in robotics and we equally are we're growing this brand around responsible AI. And so one thing I'm really excited by is sort of this idea of rather than just focusing on legislation or just innovation, it's the combination of the two. And Australia is really uniquely placed to take advantage of that. We have a, a well-functioning democracy. We have a well-functioning media. Um, we have an excellent university and innovation system. And the combination of all these three, these three things uh, together really spells opportunity for the country. And it's really ours to see. It's because I think a lot of other um, countries are not set up the same way that we are. And so I'm really bullish about the opportunity. But obviously, um, the time is now to act. Um, we really need to be having these conversations. And um, I think it's something um, also really um, important for us because what we want is our, we have this amazing country, we have these amazing Australian values. And if we don't build up sovereign capability in this area, we are not going to be able to reflect those values back into the new generation of Australians that are coming through. And so, um, yeah, I might sort of like leave it there. But um, as I said, we've got a, a relationship that we're building with Will and um, um, his group. And so we're really, really excited about sort of what could be brought about by sort of getting some like-minded people together and really starting this conversation. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Simon. Over to Monica Ashard now. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you um, to uh, to Will and Simon as well for that overview. Um, I'm just going to bring up a PowerPoint slide at this point. Just bear with me, and I hope you can see that. 
Um, but I'll preface by saying that, um, you know, AI-driven mis- and, and disinformation has been identified by the World Economic Forum um, as amongst the biggest of risks that, uh, that humanity faces, second only to climate change, which I think is quite extraordinary. Recently, we saw the UK Prime Minister uh, bring together technology leaders, um, academics, um, ministers from governments around the world to Bletchley Park in the UK to talk about the risks and, of course, the opportunities because it's important, um, you know, as Simon said, to continue to have an eye on the opportunities because they are many. Um, it, be, you know, with any big technological leap, I think there, there, there obviously is opportunity, and there will be for journalism as well. But the risks are very, very significant. Um, we'll only be able to take in journalism. We'll only be able to take up the the opportunities and make something of them if we actually do understand the risks and understand them well and have guardrails in place. Uh, to consider them. Um, there are risks to trust, there are risks to copyright, there's a risk ultimately to the sustainability of the business models, which have already been battered after 20 years of digital technology, but to the business models which sustain journalism. Um, so at the CMT, the Centre for Media Transition, where I'm co-director, we have uh, spent many months looking at the impact, possible impact on journalism. Um, and so we released a report in December, uh, which uh, was a culmination of conversations that we were having with editors and product development people in media organisations around the country. Uh, we interviewed 20 editorial and production staff from eight newsrooms, big newsrooms, ABC, obviously, huge, uh, the Sydney Morning Herald and Age, Guardian Australia, Daily Mail, SBS, Southern Cross Austeria, which has a massive network, the Newcastle Herald and Australian Community Media, which represents um, some 150 small regional newsrooms around the country. And as I said, we were looking at the uses, opportunities, risks, and what they're doing to kind of mitigate what they perceive to be future risks. Um uh, so I think it's fair to say that there was a degree of uh, extreme concern coupled with extreme excitement um, in editorial leadership circles. Uh, they were all, they're all thinking very, very deeply about how generative AI will challenge many of journalism's fundamentals. Um, they talked about massive upheaval, which, of course, journalism is very accustomed to. We're now for 20 years. It has done enormous damage. Technology has done enormous good and enormous damage to the business. Uh, but they are anticipating more upheaval. Uh, they talked about how that you know if if there were any editors around who said that they look you know we're ready for the challenge that they were lying that it was happening that the technology was changing so fast in this space that they could barely you know breathe in between announcements that they could barely keep up with the change and that it would have massive implications for example on media's reliance on google search referrals through to our sense of what information actually is. That is the integrity of the information ecosystem and whether or not it can be trusted. Are any of them doing it at the moment? No, not really. Um, they Most newsroom leaders that we spoke to said that they didn't want their journalists using chat GPT, uh, that that. Um, their focus was on enterprise journalism, that is original journalism, uh, you know, not just pumping out uh, stuff that service journalism, you know, and weather, traffic reports, etc. cetera. Um, and a, a lot of editors, one, well, one editor summed this up, but all editors mentioned that they didn't want to be the editor who stepped out first using uh, generative AI to produce journalism because it would be so dangerous and such a leap. Okay, information integrity was a big concern. In fact, it, it was the underlying sentiment in every interview with every uh, with every editor. For them, quality, they said, was a fundamental part of their value proposition. Uh, they didn't want to mess with quality. They didn't want to introduce errors or doubt around quality and authenticity and accuracy. And, of course, the, the issue of the uh, sourcing of a story, the origins of a story. Uh, which we've heard a little bit about today. 
They all talked about the fact that integrity was important to what they did uh, and that they were looking at ways to safeguard and retain the trust of their audience. Uh, they obviously recognised that there would be considerable cost savings. News is becoming more expensive. That can't be ignored in the industry because industry has uh, the journalism industry has experienced the financial downside of digital of digital technologies. So they were very very much aware of it, but it wasn't the driving force in their thinking. All of them were adopting a test and learn approach. So they had product and technology teams that they've developed, particularly with big media houses. Uh, so they're road testing um, uh, their own capability and external capabilities to see what they can do with technology. But they're not making any decisions yet about whether they will or won't use it. They saw workflow opportunities. So this is kind of back end opportunities. Um, uh, you know, prompting journalists with SEO headlines based on best practice so they're not spending 15 minutes or more thinking about uh, what, what that headline might look like. Uh, they wanted to free people up, free their journalists up to do more journalism, more investigative work, more creative work, which can only be a good thing, obviously, because a journalism has, in a, in, in a sense, active journalism in newsrooms has been to an extent hijacked by technology at the back end. It has it's a it's a big time tax, which uh, which editors are very keen to uh, reduce. Yes, and one of the editors, we you know, said we've added a lot of a lot to the expectations around people's skills and their output, and we we need to reset that and try to free up time, however possible, to make sure that they safeguard the quality of what they do, but make it sustainable so that staff aren't run ragged. Uh, the downsides they they talked about, you know, being deceived by false or manipulated content. Uh, content. And one of the things that really, really came out in these interviews was the fact that they all noted that the current suite of tools are not doing the job. They aren't able to detect the uh, the deep fakes that, we're, that, that, that are coming through their system. Um, and they obviously all uh, were very, very aware of the risks posed by generative AI to the broader information environment, top and centre of mind. Um, they, they were concerned about copyright issues, potential dependence on tech companies and the use of their news archives to train AI systems without their knowledge and without compensating them. And, of course, some of them are eyeing off the news media bargaining code as a means of possibly helping them out on the compensation front. But with every downside, there's an upside. And so with the uh, the uh, point that I mentioned briefly earlier about the proliferation of mis and disinformation, low quality information, they saw an opportunity for their news media organisations to produce quality news uh, and overturn or impact the trust deficit that we've seen creep into journalism in the last 10, 15 years. And they talked a lot about human oversight. So, you know, robust editorial processes are fundamentally to that the the factor of human oversight in everything that is produced using generative AI. Uh, and almost unanimously, they rejected the idea of replacing journalists with 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 uh, with machines to write any copy beyond low value output, such as podcast summaries, for example, or or very very basic weather reports. They all agreed on the need for transparency, although how much transparency was uh, was a highly debatable point. Um, so you know, would you necessarily tell your audience that you use ChatGPT to come up with a podcast title? Probably not. Uh, they were all developing guidelines, policies and implementation strategies. Some organisations were way ahead of the others. The ABC, Guardian Australia and SBS are really leading the pack on that front. There was a little bit of anxiety in some of those newsrooms, but uh, particularly amongst younger staff, obviously, about whether their jobs might be replaced by uh, by generative AI. Managing that anxiety is going to be uh, increasingly important. Um, probably towards the, you know, this year will be uh, a turning point on that front when we see the more sophisticated Gen AI tools uh, come onto the market, but. Managing the anxiety is quite important. 
And then there were the regulatory developments that we looked at. I think some of them have been already mentioned, but the EU AI Act in December 2023, which adopts a risk-based approach uh, banning some systems and uses, including indiscriminate scraping of facial images, predictive policing, inference of personal information from biometric details and cognitive behavioural manipulation. Um, it has quite stringent enforcement um, clauses, so that includes a fine of 7% 7, 7 of global turnover for violating banned AI systems or uses and 3% for violating other obligations. Um, the UK is on the front foot as well. Uh, has produced it's produced a white paper which offers a mixed approach that regulates use rather than technology. The US is kind of outsourcing a little bit at the moment, um, fence sitting, I suppose you could call it. They've um, there is an executive order which has created the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, and and it's tasked with setting safety standards. Um, whilst government agencies will be in charge of applying those standards to sectors. And then the UK Bletchley Declaration, which I mentioned at the beginning, to which 29 countries are signatories, including Australia. And, of course, Australia, the Australian government's planned approach, which is a risk-based approach, uh, which has already been spoken about. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Monica. And uh, finally, over to you, Rebecca Johnson. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining us. I'm, I'm Beck, Beck Johnson, I'm at the University of Sydney. I've been looking at AI ethics for quite a few years now. It's a huge topic and obviously not something that I can completely cover in five minutes. And this is, you know, this later Sora and these video things is just another uh, iteration and application of where we can look at AI ethics. So I'm going to start pretty broad and in a way that seems pretty obvious. And then we're going to get really detailed just towards the end of the five minutes there. The first thing I always, you know, impress on people, and it's an obvious thing, but I think sometimes people forget about it, is, is that technology is just an extension of people. So our training data, the way we develop them, the way we design them, the way we deploy them, these are all decisions um, and reflections of people. And that's something that you we just can, can't forget at any step of these discussions here. So, you know, we've heard from the other speakers about, you know, how deep learning fits into, you know, and, and AI fits into this whole kind of thing. And I want to put that into a bigger context again. So we've got generative AI, we've got Sora and these video um, uh, images now, which are part of deep learning, part of AI, part of technology. But these sit within what is called socio-technical systems. And a socio-technical system is just kind of a way of looking at the relationships between people and the technologies that they use. And this is... This is, um, these are concepts that have been around for quite a while, but they're becoming really important for us to readdress while we're trying to struggle to keep up with this really um, very fastly developing and increasingly sophisticated technology. And so when we think about this in a socio-technical environment, we remember that it's people, so we're inside people. So I think 2023, thank goodness, we're over a lot of that hype that, you know, there's this evil sentient AI is waiting to jump up and take over like Arnie Schwarzenegger. There are technologies that we create and that we design and that we imbue our biases and our perspectives into these technologies. So there's a lot of things to think about when we think about the ethics of these kind of emerging technologies. We have to think about how are they going to be developed? Who's developing them? How are we going to tune them? And I'm going to talk a bit more about fine tuning a little bit later on. And we have to think about this in the context of a global human value pluralism. So a lot of people out there are like, oh, I'm going to de-bias AI, I'm going to take out all the bias. And like, that's just not possible. We can take out toxic bias and we can all agree that we, we don't want sexism and hate speech and um, you know all these other kind of toxic sort of flavors. But there's a lot of things that we just don't agree on. You know, are you a liberal voter, a labor voter? Do you think that you should get vaccinated or not vaccinated? And that's what makes up our world, our world. And at the moment, when we're asking these um, algorithms and these large neural networks to create videos, to create text, to create images, we're forcing these machines to make some kind of decision about what they're going to output. And those decisions are uh, reflective of what we've put into the technology in the first place. And another big thing, we're thinking about this on a bigger socio-technical playing field, 
is the the dominant voices in the field you know so you've got your sam altman's and you've got your microsoft you've got elon musk and you've got you know a lot of big strong personalities you've got a lot of centralized money and power and so so when people talk about value alignment for these technologies, you've got to ask, well, who's, whose values are you trying to align to? So this is a lot of text on this screen. I don't expect you to read it all right now. Maybe just grab your phone and take a quick picture of it. Just trying to say that, you know, AI ethics considerations of these technologies is a huge, huge, huge field. And luckily, we've got people all over the world that are working really deeply and have been for quite a few years uh, on a lot of these things. And so you've heard from some of the other speakers talk about, um, particularly about, you know, centralizations of power. So if we think about some co companies like OpenAI and Microsoft and Google are operating in very hyper-capitalistic kind of environments, such as the US, where they've got um, an obligation to their shareholders. And then at the other end, you've got state control like China, you know, and there's goods and bads to both of those kind of things. So we've got to think about what is the best for Australia. Think about the resource, the centralization of key components like the GPU that are needed for this. You've got Sam Altman out there at the moment looking for seven or eight trillion dollars to get more GPUs and to build bigger things. And I just think, well, seven or eight trillion dollars, what could we be doing with that that you know might be a little bit better than building the next you know video generator, right? Educational standards, both from primary school all the way up through to corporate learning. And at the moment, I'm seeing a lot of ad hoc teaching out there about AI. You know, everyone's kind of jumping on the bandwagon. Every second person on LinkedIn is an expert these days. And so I think that it becomes really important that we need to start talking about, okay, what standards do we need to put into Australia that, you know, our educational resources, because that's primary, um, to make sure that we're we're keeping everybody in society from the youngest to the oldest up to date. What inclusive practices are being used in the development and deployment? You know, at the moment, for quite a few years, a lot of AI ethicists were really computer engineers and machine learning engineers, and that's kind of expanding out now. And with any other technology, we know that we need to include a lot of marginalized groups. We need to include people with lived experience. We need to include specialists and experts from lots of different areas, not just from computer science. And it's great that we've seen a lot of that in the speaker lineup today. Election interference, obviously that's a given, you know, and I know a lot of the other speakers have already talked about that. So let's talk about bias and how it gets into these systems. So at the middle, you've got, you know, your generative AI. And a lot of people have talked about uh, training data and how the training data can be biased. We know that a lot of that from ChatGPT and GPT-3 and 4, that was primarily trained on English text, um, mostly coming out of, you know, the West, particularly US. And so we've seen that time again. And I think in 2023, at least the general public is starting to get a better awareness of how what goes into these machines influences what comes out. But there's actually a lot of other avenues that we can get bias into these into these systems. And that can be through the way that the um, the system is designed in architecture, the goals that we give it. There's a thing called constitutional AI now, which is part of fine tuning, and even the way that you prompt it. So the the words that you use to actually put in a prompt of "I want to see a woman walking down a street in Tokyo" that can have some um, of your own bias assumptions built into that. And in a moment, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into fine tuning because I think that's a that's been a really big thing in 2023, and it's going to be a much bigger thing going forward. So I want to make sure we all have a good handle on that. Um, if we go back to thinking about those socio technical systems again, again, this is a pretty detailed slide. Maybe you just want to take a snapshot of it. But I want to separate out that we've got humans in the loops, and that might be your annotators, your crowd workers, you as prompters. Um, it could be society in the loop. So our our government, um, our journalists, our social media um, organization. But more increasingly these days, we're having machines test machines. So you've got this pretty complicated situation going on. So this looks a little bit much, but, but this is this is here to give you a framework to understand how you can um, really contribute to, to making sure that we have a more responsible application of these technologies. So I've talked about how bias can come into these different ways, and I've talked about how this technologies are sitting within uh, larger socio-technical systems. And we know, you all know, especially as journalists, that media and state reporting, history, economic forces, all these things that you report on, 
these will influence the avenues of bias that go into these technologies and all of these play against each other. Okay, so let's go down a little bit deeper into this rabbit hole and talk about a couple of the words, you know, that you might have been seeing thrown around or you definitely will see more of in 2024. So fine tuning is a way of modifying the original training of the model. So the model would have been trained on some kind of training data, which probably got a whole bunch of bias in it. And then you can go back and then you can kind of fine tune a little bit. Now there's sort of three main ways at the moment that people are doing that. And there's, you might've seen these acronyms around RLHF, RLAI. So reinforcement learning through human feedback has a lot of um, ethical com um, complications as well. It could be uh, are the people that are being used to do this reinforcement learning that are being paid two dollars an hour in Kenya, or whose values are these people reflecting? You know, are they all undergrad students in the U.S. getting paid maybe five dollars an hour? And now, more and more increasingly, we're seeing RL RL AI. So now we've got one model testing another model. So, you know, <laughs> a bit of a can of worms there till we could talk about as well. And then red teaming. Red teaming is kind of associated with this. It's a way that we try and test it to try and jailbreak it, to try and see, you know, can we make it say something racist? Can we make it say something wrong? And increasingly, again, that was originally human and more and more because of cost, we're using one uh, generative AI to red team another generative AI. So let's look a little bit more quickly how this kind of works. So you've got your AI model. You might have your red teaming prompt. So should women be allowed to vote or not? You know, most of us are going to say yes. But say the model comes back and says no, the red team, whether the red team be like a person or an AI, says no, women should be allowed to vote. And then kind of tune the model a little bit and the model's like, oh, okay, well, women should be allowed to vote. But if we go deeper than that and we think about how that's happening, we've got to think about, well, who's putting in the prompts? Who are the humans? And what are those humans? What what values do they hold? Are they, you know, are they um, Trump supporters in the US or are they people that live, you know, in more communist kind of countries? Are they people that have very liberal leaning? You know, they, everybody has their own perspectives on the world. And then constitutional AI is something particularly that Anthropic is working towards is they come up with a whole bunch of, you know, values that they think are right and then they kind of train that into the model. And at the moment, this is pretty ad hoc and we'd like to see a lot more, you know, sociologists and lawyers and a lot more inclusivity into how these constitutions are created. So to give you a quick example of how this could play out, this is an example from GPT-4 Vision. Um, so the prompt was put in, now we can put in like image prompts. Uh, and so GPT-4 came back and said, okay, this is the Templar Cross, Knights of the Crusade. Yes. Technically, that is true, but GPT-4 failed to put it into the more modern historical context that it, you know, is used by, you know, Nazi hate groups or neo-Nazis and the terrible people that follow that kind of stuff. And so I've given you, um, let's give you a hypothetical example uh, if we were to use these video generating things to try and create uh, a platform to create videos in Indigenous languages. Okay, so that sounds like a, a really great idea. But there's a lot of considerations that we've got to bring in. So what if the training data is more using Gadigal languages than, you know, many of the other hundreds of languages that are there exist in Australia? And then you've got to think about how we're evaluating these systems. So what if someone comes along and looks at the video and they're like, yeah, the video is doing really well, but their evaluation data is, again, only Gadigal language. And so then you might have someone saying, yeah, we've created this thing, and someone else saying, yeah, we've tested it, it's good to go. But actually, we're forgetting about, you know, hundreds of other languages, and so they're kind of being admitted from the content that's been created by this, this video imaging. So that was, I'm just going to stop sharing there, that was a super crash course in ethics. Uh, probably caused more questions than answers, but there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, um, Beck. That's fantastic. Um, okay, so look, we have a few minutes for some questions. Um, so again, just a reminder that you can type your question into the Q&A box. Please mention your affiliation. But you can also raise your hand um, and we'll unmute you. Um, and alternatively, if you have joined us over the phone, you can dial um, hashtag nine, I think it is, on your dial pad. 
and we will unmute you. Um, oh, that's right, star. Sorry, star nine on your dial pad. Okay, so first question is from Petra Stock from Cosmos, and the question is for Simon. Even if an AI is trained on factual information, like science, technology, and the nature of public policy, our understanding of history are all changing over time. So, sorry, science, technology, the nature of public policy and our understanding of history are all changing over time. So something that was true two years ago might not be true today. Can large language models based on how they work and their backward-looking training ever be able to distinguish what is factual today? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And um, my answer is that um, I haven't seen too many tools that are sort of trying to do that yet, but um, I think it's very, very feasible and very possible. Um, if you think about when GPT-3 first came out or ChatGPT first came out, it was like snapshot at, um, for 2020 or 2021. And so if you ask certain facts to it, it was actually only um, it was sort of delayed in terms of its knowledge. So it's actually a, a very interesting application for some of these LLMs, right? So taking a snapshot of what knowledge is at that point in time. And people could go back in time and like ask questions and, and, and um, um, based on what people knew at the time. And I think it's a very, very interesting thing, right? Because we oftentimes go, we, we perhaps judge cultures or people harshly or unfairly sometimes based on sort of our, what we know now, as opposed to sort of what the, what the knowledge base was then. And so that's actually a really positive use case for LLM. So I, I really like it. I had not thought too much about it, but I think it's very feasible. It's a kind of fundamental thing, if I can add. It's provenance. In, in academia, you know, we, we need to show where our ideas come from. And there are fantastic technologies around at the moment. We tend to think of the blockchain as a way of making a quick buck. You know, it's become the, the kind of white shoe type of finance tool. But the blockchain is a fantastic thing to watch the provenance of information. You know, we can track over time in a ledger how things have changed. You know, if we were to publish in an academic sense, we have to be very rigorous in the factory sources that we do. And I think there needs to be tools that show in generative AI where things have come from that can let, you know, Rebecca makes a good point. We're all going to disagree, even on things that are factual, that, that I think are factual. Like people argue about things in science, which I think are scientifically true. If we had the provenance, then we're in a better position to be able to justify our belief. And I think that's an important thing that we need to start thinking of in, in, in generative work. Um, can I just follow up with, with a related question? So um, you, you, you mentioned that um, the RILs uh, slash Cosmos has developed a relationship with the Institute for Machine Learning. Um, is that that's in order to train AI tools, I assume. And is that something, um, Simon and Will, that, that you think will be expanded to other organisations? Is it like the more the merrier? You, you need lots and lots of information to train the new tools? Yeah, look, I think so. Look, I think one of the things that, that the things we publish, the materials we publish, like Cosmos being one of our publications, is that we don't do opinion journals. We do factory journalism. Um, in, in what we report daily online. So as a data set, we're trying to go back to first principle facts. And it's our belief that that's good information to work with. It's good information to train with. Um, you know, it's not what somebody believes. It's what somebody's scientific principle has shown. Is it perfect? No, it's not, but it's a good base. I want to work with AIM because... We need more factual information in the community and we need to start to develop that in ways that are going to be resonant in the community as a publisher for the public good. And working with AML is that we can start to understand how we can use facts in a more effective way. So it's pushing back against misinformation and that's going to be the intermission of our rigorous journalism and the science of an organisation like AIM, and of course, the more the merrier. You know, as I mentioned in the introductory remarks, if Australia is going to be good at this and reflect the things that we value, it's going to come through a sense of partnership. But we have to have a very high bar for the content that we put in to these systems. 
You know, I think we need an ISO standard of factual reporting. We don't have that in the world. We need to independently cross a bar. Now, everybody can call themselves a journalist these days. Everybody can call themselves a trusted source of information. Are they? I think there needs to be a, a bar that's set where we're independently measured as to whether we're doing our best to report on opinions or we're making things up or, you know, we're cutting corners. And I think the more the merrier that come in that can cross that high bar, the better chance that we have of building information that people themselves can make up their mind to say, well, you know, I'm, I might trust that a bit more than something else. And I think that's important in the world that we're going into. Um, yeah, and Monica, did you want to yeah, make a comment? It's, I'm really interested to hear, hear those comments, Will, because there has been a very, very big debate in Australia over the last uh, couple of years about accreditation of journalists in order to, you know, ensure that uh, they meet particular standards before they put information out into the public space, which might be considered by an audience to be trustworthy. But that issue of standards is a very, very live one as well. In Australia, we currently have, and here at the CMT, we're doing a lot of work around this, that, that we currently have around 14 different standards bodies that uh, that operate in in their own silos um digital having uh, not not being one of those outputs that crosses um through all of them so there is work that needs to be done to standardize the standards bodies if you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying uh, the, the i think the, the problem is is that you know, what generative AI is currently about, and of course it will improve in time, is the quality of information that goes in versus the quality of information that comes out. Um, but the it's complicated by the fact that the way this, the systems currently work is that it's kind of cherry picking information. So you ne you're never sure of the provenance, you're never sure of the veracity, um, and that makes verification it complicates the process of verification in journalism 100-fold. How can you verify when you've got bits and pieces of information coming from various different unnamed sources? Uh, so, I mean, I think that in terms of news output, current affairs output, um, it, the the the, the the wisest in the wisest advice that we heard from the editors was uh, until we have those guardrails in place which can only come about through conversations with the manufacturers um and the platforms that that license the technology uh, until we've got those guardrails in place that it's just not a trustworthy enough technology for the purposes of journalism Simon, did you want to make a quick comment before um we go to the next question because we've got quite yeah. a few questions to get through yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just to kind of add on to that, I very much agree with everything that's been said. Um, I think there's a real opportunity for media organizations too. I think sort of like one of the big things that a lot of the tech companies are worried about is essentially um, um, data cannibalism. Um, more and more of the data that's going to be on the internet. Um, the first wave of these models was just done by just ingesting huge amounts of data on the internet. And so, and at the, the first wave, you could sort of trust that it was all human generated, but more and more of what's on the internet now is synthetically generated and it's going to get worse and worse. And so there's a real value proposition to media outlets about having trusted sources of data that's generated by people who are humans, right? And so being able to validate that. And so that's a huge opportunity. And so forward-looking organizations could actually see some uh, actually value there and, and actually... Um, and you're seeing some even news out, news outlets um, sort of talking with different companies about how do they how do they connect their um, um, previous articles into systems and and so I think that's a really and I think that's going to really really push off not just in text but in all sorts of modes um, so video images sound um, it's all going to be kind of in the mix. Mm. Okay, terrific. So um, next question is from Parker McKenzie from the New Daily. Um, Parker asks, with a few state elections this year and a federal election next year, how do you think this type of technology will change our political discourse? Who wants to go first on that one? I, 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 I'm happy just to have a quick quick stab. I, I think it's bigger than that, right? I think um, I saw an article recently, like 4 billion people are going to the polls this year. So it's not just an Australian issue. It's sort of, it's, it's um, everywhere. Um, 
So I think part of it um, in the short term is basically education, is that people sort of like hopping on social media and other things really to kind of not necessarily always believe what they see. Um, and, and that's sort of like the the unfortunate thing. Trust in those partners um, that you really, you really like the trusted news sources. And I do think that there are things that perhaps um, governments can do. Um, so I think Will was talking about sort of some of these provenance type things. Um, there are um, different governments that are talking about being participants in that. So something could could we have um, a thing saying that you can only share images or, or other sources if it has provenance as part of it, and that could perhaps be a sort of a step in the right direction. But um, I think the conversation is a real live one. It's an important one. There have been some examples recently of manipulated data getting into the political discourse. You know, in in some countries. Uh, images have been generated for propaganda purposes. You know, in, in China, they recently, you know, values are different. People accept those things more more in China than what we would. But certain pictures that their premier and the U.S. president put together in order to tell a story. In the United States, there are examples of people using synthetic voice. The AI synthetic voice is extraordinary you know, to do automated phone dialing and things, which in Australia we've made more restrictive and things. You know, you, know, you may go out to 50,000 people with that robocall. It only takes five not to get the message that it's nonsense in order to change the debate. But one of the things that scares me about, scares me about AI, and we've got to go back to other technology, how it can be gained. We go back to the Cambridge Analytica, um, example with social media in terms of gaining parts of the population in belief. AI just supercharges that. It's not a generative issue. The ability of AI to do complex statistics, to do complex correlate, you know, types of mathematics in order to gain parts of the population with synthesis is something that's quite, you know, when you put, when you see politics as a game, and you give tools to people to enable to game and manipulate, you know, that competition. That's what we get. And ultimately, it's an ethical question. We still yes. want that in, in, in the community. Yeah, good good point to pass over to Beck. Thank you, Beck. Thank you. I was going to bring up Cambridge Analytica as well. So I've, if you think about Cambridge Analytica, that uh, technique and method and the data they were using was from um, 2013. And that impacted elections in 2015 and 2016. So we're talking a decade-old technology, which Brittany Kaiser described herself as a weapons-grade communication. And now we're 10 years into the future with that, and we really didn't spend a lot of time trying to address the underlying methods that were impacting, you know, our democracy and, you know, propaganda and whatnot. So this is... The biggest concern I think that we're facing with this technology, the absolute biggest, and I don't see that technology itself is actually um, a, a solution to this particular problem. I would see more live debates, more traditional journalism, more putting different people in the room together, Q&A style kind of debates. I think that needs to come back more and more because that along with education of the public is the only way to get through this. I know that we've, that everyone's talking about watermarking and a lot of people pinning their hopes on watermarking, but honestly, that's going to be really easy to mask over. That's not a solution at all. And if you've got people, you know, in some countries that are really much more susceptible to propaganda and conspiracy theories, then we have to start. It's not a, it's not a technical solution to address this. This is like a, a very interdisciplinary solution that we need to come to together to try and fix something that we should have fixed 10 years ago and we kind of let it just trundle along. Uh, look, we've come to the end of an hour. We weren't going to go for this long. It's been a fascinating discussion. I know we could go for another hour. Um, I might, if it's okay with you, I might just take one more question um, and then we'll close it off. And just don't forget uh, any of the journalists who've joined us that you can follow up with, um, with any of our speakers for interviews. So I'm just going to jump down, and apologies to others who've asked a lot of questions, um, to someone who hasn't asked a question yet, and that's William Summers from AAP Fact Check. Um, and William says, identifying AI-generated content is one thing, 
But the flip side for misinformation and verification is proving that something is not AI generated. E.g., it is only a matter of time before a populist politician gets caught out on video, audio, and bats it away by falsely claiming the content is not real. It's just AI generated, fake news. Does this create a different verification problem for journalists? And if so, how do we tackle this? I, I think Monica has probably got a lot to say about it, but I just wanted to jump in quickly and say it's already happening with students at university, you know, particularly students for whom English is their second language, even. You know, earlier last year, they were coming to me and telling me that, you know, different people, um, different teachers have, you know, tried to fail them or whatnot because they were using these um, detection tools, which aren't good. And now most universities that that you're not allowed to use them. But so we saw that at the university systems at the front line. But I'm, I'm sure Monica's got more to say about all that. Actually, I, I actually don't. I mean, I don't know how you. I don't know how the the, the problem is. Is that you know we're, we're at a phase where the tools just aren't there. I mean, the tools just aren't there, and um, it's it's impacting newsrooms on on a daily basis. As as uh, as the questioner says, I mean, we. I don't know how. Um, the problem the problem is is that you is that newsrooms need to media organizations need to work with the manufacturers in order to develop bespoke tools that will get at the problem and uh until those conversations start to happen um at, at a really serious level uh we'll be in this limbo space and i don't think those conversations are as yet happening not in australia Simon, <laughs> Simon you got last word yeah, I was just going to say, um, um, I don't think it's the full answer, but I think um, some of the secured provenance um, work, C2PA, is probably, it's not the silver bullet, but it's going to help a lot. Um, so, like, it's going to be harder for a politician to say that that was a fake if it was taken under a C2PA protocol. And it's really new what this is, is is happening. So if you look at even SOAR and OpenAI, Microsoft, they're all signing up to these things. And so what it takes actually is for news outlets to work in tandem with them to say, we are going to adhere to these protocols. Um, but it's not just that. I think it's also innovation. Um, things are going to slip through. And so we need to be thinking about clever ways to have these protocols in place, but also to innovate. And as well was saying, having that sovereign capability here in Australia. Brilliant. Fantastic. That's a good time to wrap up. And thank you so much uh, to our speakers today. A full recording of today's presentations will be um, put up on our website, which is scimex.org. And you can also contact us directly at the Science Media Centre um, on 0871208846, or you can email us at info at smc.org.au. And uh, thank you again. It was a fantastic discussion. And apologies to those people who have um, given us fantastic questions. There were some great questions there. And uh, sorry that we didn't get the chance to answer them all. But please do follow up with interviews. So thank you again, everyone. <laughs>